Chapter Twelve of Poison Romance and Poison Mysteries by Charles John Samuel Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: The Bravo Mystery. Antimony, like arsenic, to which in many ways it is closely allied, claims also to be ranked among the historic poisons. It was known and used by the ancient Greek and Roman physicians as a medicinal agent and for certain purposes it is perhaps unequalled at the present time the metal is a brittle silvery and very brilliant substance in the form of plates and crystals and is largely used in the arts as an alloy the most common form being britannia metal which is a compound of antimony lead and tin the old poculo emetica or everlasting emetic cups were made of antimony it is found abundantly in nature as a sulphide, also combined with various metals and with quartz and limestone. From these it is separated by fusion, the heavy metallic portion sinking by the law of gravity and abandoning the impurities which remain on the surface of the molten mass. Arsenic is a frequent contamination of commercial antimony, and it is very important that it should be eliminated before antimony is prepared for use in medicine. Poisoning by tartarated antimony causes a peculiar metallic taste in the mouth, which is speedily followed by vomiting, burning heat, pains in the stomach, and purging, difficulty in swallowing, thirst, cramp, cold perspirations, and great debility. In smaller doses, it produces these effects in a mitigated form, which causes symptoms somewhat similar to natural disease, such as distaste for food, nausea, and loss of muscular power. For this reason, doubtless, it has been a favorite medium with many criminal poisoners, including Dove, Smethurst, Pritchard, and others. But there is no trial in which antimony has figured that caused more interest than the Bravo mystery of 1876. The story of this case begins with the marriage of Mr. Bravo, a young barrister of about thirty years of age, to Mrs. Ricardo, who was then a wealthy widow and a lady of considerable personal attractions. After the marriage, which followed a very short acquaintance, the couple went to reside in Balham. According to a statement made by Mrs. Bravo, she informed her husband before the marriage of a former lover and there is little doubt that it rankled in Mr. Bravo's mind, and he frequently taunted his wife with the fact. He was a strong, healthy, and temperate man, but appears to have been both weak and vain in character. On Tuesday, April 18, 1876, after breakfast at his own house at Balham, he drove with his wife into town. On their way a very unpleasant discussion took place. Arriving in town, he had a Turkish bath, lunched with a relative of his wife at st james restaurant and walked on his way home to victoria station with a friend and fellow barrister whom he asked out for the following day he arrived back home about half past four shortly after his return mr bravo went out for a ride in the course of which his horse bolted and carried him a long distance and he got back to his home very tired and exhausted at half-past six he was noticed leaning forward on his chair, looking ill, and with his head hanging down. He ordered a hot bath, and when getting into it he cried out aloud with pain, putting his hand to his side. The bath did not appear to relieve him much, and he seemed to be suffering pain all through dinner, but appeared to avoid attracting the attention of his wife and Mrs. Cox, her companion, who dined with him. The food provided during the dinner was partaken of more or less in common by all three, but this was not the case as regards the wine. Mr. Bravo drank Burgundy only, while Mrs. Bravo and Mrs. Cox drank Sherry and Marsala. The wine drunk by Mr. Bravo had been decanted by the butler some time before dinner. How long he could not say, but he noticed nothing unusual about it. The wine was of good quality, and Mr. Bravo, who was something of a connoisseur of wine, remarked nothing peculiar in its taste, but drank it as usual. If he had Burgundy for luncheon, he finished the bottle at dinner, 
but if not as on the day in question the remains of the bottle were put away in an unlocked cellaret in the dining-room the butler could not remember whether any burgundy was left on this day or not but however none was discovered this cellaret was opened at least twice subsequently to this and prior to mr bravo's illness once by mrs cox and once by the maid mr bravo seems to have eaten a good dinner although he was evidently not himself from some cause or other it was said he was suffering from toothache or neuralgia and had just received a letter that had given him some annoyance the dinner lasted till past eight o'clock after which the party adjourned to the morning-room where conversation continued up to about nine o'clock mrs bravo and mrs cox then retired upstairs leaving mr bravo alone and mrs cox went to fetch mrs bravo some wine and water from the dining-room mrs bravo remained in her room and prepared for bed and drank the wine and water brought to her by mrs cox who remained with her the housemaid on taking some hot water to the ladies room as was her usual custom at half-past nine was asked by mrs bravo to bring her some more marsala in the glass that had contained the wine and water on her way downstairs to the dining-room the girl met her master at the foot of the stairs he looked queer and very strange in the face but did not appear to be in pain according to her statement he looked twice at her yet did not speak though it was his custom but passed on mr bravo was alone after the departure of his wife and mrs cox until the time when he passed the housemaid at the foot of the stairs he entered his wife's dressing-room and the maid mrs bravo's bedroom in the dressing-room according to mrs cox's statement mr bravo spoke to his wife in french with reference to the wine this had frequently been the subject of unpleasant remarks before but mrs bravo had no recollection of the conversation on this occasion after leaving his wife in her room mr bravo went to his own bedroom and closed the door the maid left mrs bravo's bedroom and met her mistress in the passage partially undressed and on her way to bed mrs bravo and mrs cox entered their bedrooms and the former drank her marsala and went to bed in about a quarter of an hour mr bravo's bedroom door was heard to open and he shouted out florence florence hot water the maid ran into mrs bravo's room calling out that mr bravo was ill mrs cox who had not yet undressed rose hastily and ran to his room she found him standing in his nightgown at the open window apparently vomiting and this the maid also saw mrs cox further stated that mr bravo said to her i have taken poison don't tell florence alluding to his wife and to this confession of having taken poison on the part of mr bravo mrs cox adhered after this mr bravo was again very sick and some hot water was brought by the maid after the vomiting he sank on the floor and became insensible and remained so for some hours mrs cox tried to raise him and got some mustard and water but he could not swallow it she then applied mustard to his feet and coffee was procured but he was also unable to swallow that meanwhile a doctor who had attended mrs bravo and who lived at some distance was sent for mrs bravo who was aroused from sleep by the maid and who seemed to have been greatly excited insisted on a nearer practitioner being sent for and in a short time a medical man living close by arrived on the scene the doctor found mr bravo sitting or lying on a chair completely unconscious and the heart's action almost suspended he had him laid on the bed and then administered some hot brandy and water but was unable to get him to swallow it in about half an hour another medical man arrived and was met by mrs cox who said she was sure mr bravo had taken chloroform both doctors came to the conclusion that the patient was in a dangerous state and endeavoured to administer restoratives 
realizing the critical nature of the case dr george johnson of king's college hospital was sent for meanwhile mr bravo was again seized with vomiting mostly blood and the doctors came to the conclusion he was suffering from some irritant poison about three o'clock he became conscious and able to be questioned he was at once asked what have you taken but from first to last he persisted in declaring in the most solemn manner that he had taken nothing except some laudanum for toothache in reply to other questions asking him if there were any poisons about the house he replied there was only the laudanum and chloroform for toothache some condy's fluid and rat poison at the stable mr bravo did not lose consciousness again until the time of his death which occurred fifty-five and a half hours after he was first taken ill at an early period his bedroom was searched but nothing was found but the laudanum bottle and a little chloroform and camphor liniment which had been brought from another room there were no remains of any solid poison in paper glass or tumbler and nothing to indicate any poison had been taken the post-mortem examination showed evidence of great gastric irritation extending downwards but there was no appearance of any disease in the body or inflammation congestion or ulceration it was left therefore to the chemical examination to show what was the irritating substance which had been introduced into the body and supply a key to part of the mystery the matters which had been vomited in the early stage of mr bravo's illness had been thrown away but singular to relate on examination of the leads of the house beneath the bedroom window some portion of the matter was found undisturbed although much rain had fallen and the greater part must have been washed away this was carefully collected and handed to professor redwood for analysis from this matter he extracted a large amount of antimony antimony was also discovered in the liver and other parts of the body and it was concluded that altogether nearly forty grains of this poison must have been swallowed by the unfortunate man how he came to swallow this enormous dose whether the design was homicidal or suicidal there was not the slightest evidence to show or where the antimony was obtained the whole affair was shrouded in mystery and a mystery it remains end of chapter twelve